Have you ever felt like you needed a change of heart? Ever felt that way? I mean, we all do, right? Every, every single one of us in our marriages or maybe even our jobs, in our relationships with our kids or maybe even the relationship with our parents, even in commitment to exercise, sometimes we need a change of heart. We could use, <laughs> we could all use some changes, right? Would you all agree? Sometimes we realize that we need this change when we go through something that's challenging or maybe a life-changing circumstance. Um, after attending a funeral, this one person said, um, I'm learning to give flowers to people more on this side of the grave than the other side. She realized that after a tragic circumstance that took place in her life. Sometimes this change comes through a, a new understanding of what we don't have. Maybe what we've lost or what we've given up. This happens quite often over at Tender Life Maternity Home or the City Center Transitional Living when somebody decides that they want to leave prematurely, they want to leave before they graduate, they want to, ah, I want out. And then all of a sudden they, they're out and they realize, I kind of had it good. And they, they realize that right afterwards. This was the case of a man who wrote about his change of heart to his girlfriend. And let me read the letter to you. It says, my dearest Susan, sweetie of my life, I've been so devastated ever since I broke off our engagement. I'm simply devastated, he writes. Won't you please reconsider coming back to me? I could never find another woman quite like you. I need you so much. Won't you forgive me and let's make a new beginning? I love you so. And he signs it, a changed heart, John. P.S. Congratulations on winning the state lottery. <laughs> I don't know if that's truly apologetic, but it's a definite change of heart. Would you all agree? <laughs> Please allow me to share with you about a singleness of heart. The, the best change of heart, is re it really comes when you respond to what the Lord is saying. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel introduces us to the master surgeon. Ezekiel eleven nineteen says, I will give them singleness of heart and put a new spirit within them. I will take away their heart of stone and give them tender hearts instead. Verse 20 says, so they will obey my laws and regulations. Then they will truly be my people and I will be their God. See, God's goal is to cultivate perfect hearts. And the word perfect, the word I'm talking about here, the word perfect, it is in the sense of a perfect number. It, it's a whole number. It's not a fraction. It's a singleness of heart. It's undivided. God is saying, I, I want perfect hearts. I want whole hearts. Hearts that are complete towards me. Of course, our behavior is going to need to change too, right? But if our hearts are perfect, our behavior is going to follow suit. Unlike the Pharisees. Remember the Pharisees who who made sure that their behavior looked good on the outside. They, they wanted to make sure they looked good, but their hearts were so far from him. Instead, we're talking about a whole heart, completely wanting to do whatever God asks us to do. That's the heart he's looking for. Jesus gives a story of, a, of changing hearts. It's a great parable. He tells a parable of a farmer who plants seeds on different types of soil. Each type identifies a condition of how changeable our hearts can be. Our hearts can change. Our hearts can change for the better or our hearts can change for the worst. And the moral of the story is learning how to cooperate with God in order to change our heart. Because how many know we need the Lord to change our heart? Here's the, a preview on the types of soil we're talking about. We have a, a pathway, we have thorns, we have shallow soil, and we have fertile soil. And Jesus says that the fourth condition of the heart is the best kind. It's the best kind of heart, the fertile soil. But there's one interesting fact. In the beginning, all these different types came from the same soil. You understand? It all came from the same soil. But isn't it interesting how we have different types? Here's condition number one, which we call the pathway. The first place that the farmer planted was on the pathway where people would walk. 
So how did the pathway get there? Well, it was very simple. They had to walk their they had to walk to their field. And in order to walk to their field, they had to go along a certain area. So they kept going over the same area. And these people's feet would compress the soil. And then the ground became hard and it became dull. And so the constant trampling caused the soil to become a common pathway. So when the seed was thrown on it, it wouldn't penetrate it at all. It would just scatter on the, on the top. And so the enemy would come and it would, they would steal it. Jesus says that we can have the same kind of heart. We can have that kind of heart. Harden and worn by constant use, being trampled on by others. And then the things of God becomes common to us. It's not that big of a deal anymore. His grace becomes common. And we start to take church and our relationships for granted. And that begins to spread into every area of our life. You know, when it starts there, it goes everywhere. You know, when you have that, that little seed that starts to grow in one area because you're, it's just dull, all of a sudden it starts to become dull in every area of your life. Then you will not be able to understand the words and actions of God because your mind becomes dull. Your understanding becomes dim. And the Bible warns us, be careful, because when that happens... The whole life becomes dull. Everything in your life becomes dim. Everything becomes bleak. You ever notice somebody who like, they're upset about one thing or they're negative about something, and then before you know it, they're negative about everything. Well, one little thing and all of a sudden, everything, their whole life becomes negative. It feels so wonderful when you have a heart that's open to what God is doing, and you're grateful. So awesome. And that's what happens, that's what happens when you start realizing things ahead of time. When you start realizing that God's pretty amazing and he's doing things. And then you start looking at things differently. And you start to give flowers before they die. You start caring for people before they're gone. And when you begin to realize that you've never, things that you've never noticed before, gratefulness starts to break up and harden the ground. I'm telling you, when you start to notice things that you've never noticed before, you become grateful. It starts to break your heart up, and all of a sudden, you, you, be, you have an attitude, no matter, an attitude of, of gratefulness, an attitude of gratitude, no matter what happens. And even in the most challenging circumstances, the most challenging things that are going on in your life, you can still be thankful. Would you watch this video, please? say that and you don't know where, the, where that comes from. It's a wheelchair right here and I'm in that chair. Nevertheless, I say, Lord, I thank you. I can't walk on my own and people have to help me get in and out of everything, but I say, Lord, I thank you. It's hard to even make it to the bathroom by myself without the assistance of others. The Lord, I thank you. Graham, how can you say, Lord, I thank you? And it's hard for you to help yourself because I'm alive and I got another opportunity to help you. See, we often say much is given, much is required, but we don't understand the backside of that. So you think I'm going to praise him up here and I can't praise him when I'm going through my affliction. The only reason I'm going through my affliction is because the devil is smart enough to know that I change things. Just the mere fact that me being there changes things. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. See, you sit back there with your judgmental eyes and your judgmental ways and your judgmental fingers and you don't have no idea what one has gone through and where one is going to. The only reason I'm going through is because the enemy is trying to keep me from going to. And I know what he's trying to do because I'm wise and I have enough wisdom to understand that that if I could just make it to that, to that, that one point right there, Baby, it's going to be some things. It's going to be a beautiful thing. So your son may benefit. Your daughter may benefit. You may benefit. We all may benefit. If I could just make it to the other side. That's why I said, Lord, I thank you. You have no idea what I've dealt with. You have no idea what the nights have brought. You have no idea what the voices I've heard. You have no idea of the pain i felt. You have no idea what I'm going through. And still, Lord, I thank you. I hear you. I hear you talking. I hear you guessing. I hear you naysaying. I hear the stuff you're saying, but you have no idea what the enemy is trying to stop. He's trying to stop a man on a mission. Baby, I'm a winner. 
and in the end I'm going to win and you're going to see the story and you're going to see how it developed and you're going to see how I overcame adversity and you then you're going to understand or you may not understand because you don't want to understand what is at stake. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. If you had to choose anybody, I'm glad you chose me, Lord. Because I thank you because I'm built for this. I'm built for this time. I'm built for this moment. I'm built for this challenge. I'm, I'm built for this mess that I'm going through. So, Lord, I thank you for choosing me. You got the right one, baby. Lord, I thank you. Devil, use a lie. Use a lie. I don't believe nothing you say. I don't believe nothing you may impregnate uh, minds with. I don't believe nothing you may show me. I believe the word of God. I believe you voice. I believe the things that he's done with me. I believe the things that he's done to me. I believe. See, see some of y'all just take that for granted, that word I believe. And you just believe when everybody's clapping for you and everybody's smiling for you and everybody's hollering. You go boys and you go girls. See, when ain't nobody there, I believe. And right now, I'm here to tell you. And God knows, baby, I believe. It's going to be a beautiful thing. When you see a story, it's going to be a beautiful thing. When you see the glory, it's going to be a beautiful thing. When you see how all this plays out, Lord, I thank you. Hey, Ben. So what's the remedy of a hardened heart? Here's point A in your sermon notes. Practice gratefulness in all things. When you have a grateful heart, revelations happen all the time. You'll hear and you'll realize what God is doing all around you. And when that happens, you start to understand how wonderful God is. In fact, take a look at what God has to say about the Pharisees and the dull hearts and how it affected their understanding. Matthew 13, we're going to spend the rest of our time in Matthew chapter 13. Let me take you to verses 14 and 15. It says, in their case... The prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. For the heart of this people has become dull. Nobody wants a dull heart. When you have a dull heart, you can't understand. You can't understand the revelation of God. You can't, you can't understand it. Your heart is dull. Nothing breaks through. It's like the hardened ground. Nothing comes. Nothing penetrates. Matthew 13, 19 says, the seed that fell on the hard path represents those who hear the good news about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches the seed away from their hearts. So why didn't the Pharisees understand? Because they allowed their hearts to become dull of the things of God. That's one thing we can never do. Allow the things of God to become dull because the things of God are exciting and they're amazing and they're wonderful. And that's one of the most tragic things that we'll ever, we'll ever allow to happen in our life. You got to remember, it all started with the same soil. They all had the potential to be fertile. But because it had become a common pathway in certain areas due to a constant use, it became hardened. Therefore, the seeds could not penetrate and no life could be placed within. I want you to know that being grateful is not just about, it's not just a, like a polite posture either. For example, when you say, Thank you. I mean, it's, it's nice, and it's, it is polite, but it's not about just being polite. It's a safeguard for a fertile heart. And there's always something to be thankful for. Would you agree? There's always something to be thankful for. If you're not, then you're forfeiting your heart's safeguard. Don't you want your heart to be safeguarded? See, you open, the way of the, you open up a way of the enemy to set up a trap for your heart. When you're not safeguarded, when you're not seeing and having gratitude for the things that are around you. So many people are looking for things that they don't have when all around them they have all these incredible blessings. God said, you don't even realize the things that I have in front of you. You want more, but yet you don't, you're not grateful for this. Why would I give you more if you're not grateful for this? There's a story about a man and his wife who were celebrating their 60th birthday together. They're their birthdays were just a couple days apart, so every year they would celebrate their birthdays on the same day. Well, this one time they wanted to have a very 
quiet time together. They wanted to be together on their 60th. It was a milestone birthday. It was their 60th. It was a landmark. It was a big deal, right? They're, they're both turning 60. And so they decide that they want to go ahead and uh, take a, a beautiful walk by a nearby river. And they just want to be together on their 60th birthday. And as they're walking by, suddenly the wife finds this floating bottle in the river. And she reaches and grabs for it. And she popped the cork. And when she popped the cork, out came this genie. And he said, this is your 60th birthday, right? And she says, how did you know that? He says, well, I know. And he winks at her. And he goes, and because it's your 60th birthday, I'm going to grant each of you one wish. Well, excitedly, she said, Elmer and I have always wanted to go to Hawaii for our birthday. And boom, man, all of a sudden they're on the beach at Waikiki, the two of her and Elmer right on the beach at Waikiki. So he looks at Elmer and he says, Elmer, what is your wish? And he goes, hmm. He looks around at all the sudden beauty bathing women on the Waikiki beach and he sees them all around, not being grateful for his wife. And he says, I'd like to be married to a woman 30 years younger than me. And boom, all of a sudden, he became 90 years old. (laughs) We better be grateful, right? (laughs) It's a safeguard for your heart, and it could make you younger (laughs) than your years, amen? (laughs) Ungratefulness, however, is a serious issue in our lives, right? And it's even prevalent in the church, ungratefulness. The remedy to a hardened heart is to maintain a habit of gratefulness because it keeps the soil of your heart open to the Lord. And then he can work miracles in your life. He can work them in you and around you. So the second condition, condition number two in your sermon notes, is the shallow soil. Now the second condition of your heart is going to require a little bit bit more of you. It's going to require a little bit more of you. Jesus' parable tells us next that the seed is sown uh, on shallow soil. These places had a bit of soil, and right underneath the soil, this little bit of soil, there was a a type of rock called shale. So when the farmer would go and begin to plow, uh, they they would hit the shale, and and the seeds would bounce off. You, You couldn't plow through this. It was hard rock. It couldn't penetrate it unless you really dug deep. But usually that type of soil, the shallow soil, did not allow the plow to run deep. And God compares this to a heart that doesn't allow the plow of God to run too deep. For example, there's the couple that says, you need counseling. And she says, I don't need counseling. You need counseling. And then he says, no, listen, we both need to go to counseling. And she says, no, listen, we'll just get some books and we'll, we'll work through it. We, we don't let anybody, nobody needs to know our business. They want to make sure that they do something, but they don't go too deep. A lot of us don't want to go too deep. What happens is that we still allow God to plow, his plow to come through, but just on the surface, so we still look good. However, beneath the surface, There are no roots. There's no character depth. And if there's no roots, then the storm's going to topple a tree. When a tree doesn't have roots, what happens to a tree? It falls over. You ever seen a tree fall over that was uprooted because the roots weren't strong enough? We had that happen here. I remember when I first came, there was one big rain, and it was a big wind, and all of a sudden, this tree came up. When the tree came up, I go... Dang, there wasn't, there, they didn't have big roots. And how long had that tree been here and it didn't have very big roots? The importance of roots is, is a constant theme throughout the Bible. If you read, you'll, you'll read about how important the roots are, the roots that go deep in the Bible. It's important. It, it, it's Paul's prayer for the young church of Ephesus when he prayed that they would be rooted and grounded in God's love, right? And then he urged the church of Colossus to do the same, firmly rooted, developed, and established. The prophet Isaiah said it this way in chapter 37, verse 31. The ones that will bear fruit upward are the ones that will take root downward. But don't get me wrong, and please don't get too excited, because I know some of you are going, man, that's good stuff. I'm going to get deeper roots today. I'm, I'm going I'm to do that. It, it, I just want to tell you, it takes time. There's no instant root to roots. 
This, there isn't. Growing deep roots and developing deep character takes time and hard work. But you know what? The stronger the roots, the less visible they are. That's the reason a lot of us don't build long, deep roots, because nobody sees them. We only make sure that our surface looks nice, but our roots are shallow because nobody gives us a pat on the back for having nice, long roots. Nobody's going to dig around your life and say, my, you have such nice roots. (laughs) Because the deeper the roots, the less visible they are. It takes time. There's not going to be a a seminar that promises roots in five days or your money back. Can't happen. It takes time to develop deep roots and grow strong character. It will require, let me tell you, a pursuit of God. That's how you grow those roots, a pursuit of God. And that leads us to the next gem in having a changeable heart. It's asking yourself the question, what's the price I must pay? What is the price? It's all different for each of you. What's the price I must pay? I must pay. The answer is the mark of a changeable heart, which leads me to to point B in your sermon notes. Be willing to endure for the sake of growth. Be willing to endure for the sake of growth. You have to be willing to endure. Why? Because if you're not willing to endure for the sake of growth, then anything that displeases you will cause you to bail out. Anything. I I, I was talking to one of the ladies at Tender Life, and, and, and there was a point in her life that every, every day she was out. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. But she's doing amazing today because she didn't bail out. She endured. She endured. Matthew 13, 20 says, The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. Verse 21 says, But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. God is saying, listen, when things get tough, stay with it. You will not have roots if you don't stay with it. This has a lot to do with staying power. Sometimes we would rather change locations than change hearts. Sometimes we would rather change partners than change attitudes. Instead of staying to resolve a problem, we'd rather run. And we wonder why we don't have any deep roots. I love the story of A.B. Campbell, a farmer who had an orchard of trees adjacent to other orchards. And during the time of drought, there would be these other trees in the other orchards that would turn brown. Yet his trees always remained green and always remained strong. And one day the farmers came up to A.B. and they said, how is it that your trees um, are so strong and they're so, so full of life and color and ours are brown and dying? How is that? And he says, you know, I can tell you, my trees will go, they can go another two weeks without water. And one farmer says, well, how can that be? He says, well, when my trees were younger, I would frequently deprive them of water. In time, it would force the young trees to dig their roots deeper into the soil to find water. Now, during times of drought, my trees are drinking water from a much deeper source. There will be times in your life well, you will need to draw water from a much deeper source. How? By being willing to endure for the sake of growth. We have to take time for discipline. We can't take shortcuts. And then we will develop deep roots. How many want deep roots? Yeah, every, yeah we want deep roots. So that leads me to condition number three, which are the thorns. Third condition of the soil of your heart is very prevalent amongst Christians. Verse 22 says, And the one on whom the seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. See, the third condition of your heart is the heart filled with thorns. It chokes out God's word. And it it could happen to any one of us. Let me share some background in regards to this example. The fields in Jesus' time were actually square or rectangle. And when the oxen would plow the fields, they wouldn't go up one straight line. 
turn around and come back another straight line and go up and down. They would actually plow in circles. So as they would plow in circles, as you could imagine, that it could not get to the corners of the fields because it was plowing in circles. So there was these, these triangles shaped in each corner, these triangle shaped areas in each corner um, that ended up getting, they were neglected. So they ended up having thorns and weeds that would pop up there because they wouldn't get plowed. They would be neglected. And then the, the, the farmers would try to sow seeds there, but it wasn't fruitful at all because the thorns would choke out the plants and prevent them from growing because it was not attended to. So what God is saying is that people with hearts compared to thorny places are those who say, God, even though I know that I got some thorns and weeds in my life, bless me anyway. And God says, no, I, no, I can't. If you want me to bring fruitfulness to your life, you must identify the thorns and stop watering them. Instead, remove them. Because the next step of, uh, to having a successful change of heart is item number C, which is identify the thorns, stop watering them, instead remove them, remove them. We often ask God to sow among the thorns. We want him to bless us even though we're not living right, right? We say, I know, God, I know. I've got some bad habits. God says, yeah, you're right. There are thorns in your life that have a hold on you. But God says, instead, I want my word to have a hold on you. And you're the one who has to choose. It's either the thorns or it's his word. It's impossible to live with both growing side by side because one of them is going to choke out the other. A lot of times we want a good marriage, but we don't want to get rid of the thorns of anger that flare up. A lot of times we want to, we wonder why our marriage is unfruitful. We make crazy statements like, I want God to bless me, but I don't want to let go of my combated spirit. How many of you heard this? Well, this is how he made me. This is who I am. No, it's not. I'm going to tell you, no, it's not. Because all you got to do is look at the fruit of the spirit and it's combativeness is not in there. If ever in doubt, go to the fruit of the Spirit, and if it doesn't line up, no, that's not how he made you. Or you say, uh, I want to lose weight, but I don't want to let go of my food. I, I've, been, I've been there. Uh, yeah, I want to lose weight, but dang, that ice cream's good at night. <laughs> but we have to choose, don't we? We have to choose. We can't live with both. We hold on to destructive habits, but expect a successful life. It's crazy. And we tell God, just sow among the thorns. And God says, I can't do it. We Come on, God, just sow among the thorns. But he can't. He wants us to be real. It won't be fruitful if he sows among the thorns. It won't be fruitful. You must identify the thorns in the form of destructive habits of your life. Then stop watering them or stop practicing those things. Get rid of them. If you want to have a fruitful life, let go of the habits that have been trying, that have been tying you to the past. Have you ever heard the story, monkey see, monkey do, monkey stew? You ever heard that? It's how they used to catch monkeys in the Amazon. They would take a coconut and they would drill a quarter-sized hole out of, the, out of the coconut. And then they would put rice in the, in the coconut. They would tie a 10-foot uh, rope to the end of the coconut to the tree, bottom of the tree. So what the monkey would do, the monkey would come out at night, they'd see the coconut, and then they'd stick their, their hand in the, that little small quarter-shaped hole, and they'd grab the rice. And then when they'd go to pull their hand out, they couldn't pull their hand out, but the monkey wanted the rice. So the monkey would just start running with the coconut on its hand. And then after about 10 feet of running away up the tree, or running away, but generally up the tree, they'd get up the tree and ten, boom, and they'd come right back down because the, the rope would pull them down. They'd hit the bottom, they'd do it again. Then they'd do it again, and they'd do it again all night long until they finally got exhausted and were knocked out. So in the morning, the tribe would come, and they'd see the monkey unconscious now, and that night they would have monkey stew and rice for dinner. That's how they did. It sounds kind of crazy, huh? Actually, actually, it sounds like a really dumb thing. But how often do we act the same way? 
We're like those monkeys because we grab a hold of a habit and we won't let go of it. And holding on leads to a trap and the enemy wins. We need to let go and let it and run for our lives from that thing. The monkey needed just to let go of the rice and get away. He'd be okay. We need to let go of the habit that we've been holding on to. Let go of it. Run from that. One of the best ways to remove your thorny habits is by reading the Bible every single day. Some people say, I don't have time to read the Bible. You don't have time not to read the Bible. Everything you need to know in life is in this book. Like, I'm, I kid you not. Everything you need to know to live a life is right here. How could you not want to read the Bible? But yet, that's what we'll do. We'll compromise and we won't read it. But that's the only way you're going to get rid of the thorny habits in your life. Through his word, God will point out certain habits or ingrained character in your life that needs to go. It's up to you to partner with God. It's up to you to partner with him to first identify what those habits are and then let them go, release them completely. Here's the interesting thing about Jesus' whole parable. All the soils have the same potential to be fertile soil because they all came from the same field. But there's only one difference. The fertile soil allows the plow to go deep and it yields to the master. And there's the fourth gem today, point D, let the plow of the Holy Spirit touch every corner of your heart. God is saying if you want changing hearts so that you can have fertile soil, then let the plow of the Holy Spirit touch every area, every corner of your heart and in your life. It's pretty simple. In fact, the psalmist, the psalmist says it this way, Psalm 139, 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Allow the plow of the Holy Spirit to run deep. This means there's, and that's why we're talking about Staying power. That's why we're talking about enduring because when the plow runs deep, it's not always real comfortable. But that's when you stick with it and allow them to work. This means there's going to be some pain when God comes and he runs the plow deep within your life. But you got to be willing to suffer. Got to be willing to endure for the sake of growth. Only then will the roots grow deeper. If we're not willing to endure for the suffering and the pain for the Lord, then we'll never have deep roots. We have to say, Lord, whatever you need to do, run the plow of your Holy Spirit through my heart. How many of you have done this? You don't have to raise your hand. But you're praying a certain way, and you want a certain thing to happen, and you're talking, you're praying for freedom. You're praying for whatever it is, what bondage to be broken, this to happen or whatever, and then God says this to you. Yeah, you need to confess that sin. And you go, can we do it without having to do that? Lord, can we, can we not do that? Can, we, can you just fix this? God's saying, let me run deep in your life. Let me, pl- let, let me plow that stuff up. Let me plow that junk up. And sometimes it's confessing that allows that thing to get out of the field. As you allow the Lord to do this, you'll find your heart is clean and clear. But you know, we need to say, change my heart. Run it, that plow through my mind. Run it through my heart. Release the thorns, Lord, because you, we, can't, we can't sow amongst them. When your heart is clean and clear, you can't help but have a heart of thankfulness. We've got one life to live, one life for the Lord. And you know what he wants to do? He wants to bear fruit within us that is 30, 60, 100-fold. He wants to bless us like you wouldn't believe. Because he's preparing our hearts for eternity. This is why he's doing it. You understand? We're going to be in eternity, and our hearts have to be right. Because there is no drama in heaven. There is no sin in heaven. So he's preparing us now for this. Let's live today, allowing the Lord to get into every nook and cranny of our heart and let him expose to us what needs to change and let us make those changes. Change my heart, God, and make it more like yours. Make me a person after God's heart. I was reading the other day 
1 Samuel 13 and Acts 13. Both of them talk about a man after God's own heart, which is David. And it said that I'm gonna, I'm gonna take Saul out, the old king, and I'm gonna put in David because he's a man after my own heart because he wants to do all my will. How many wanna do all the will of God? See, some of us wanna do a little bit of his will, <laughs> But, but he's saying, I want you to do all my... That's a man and a woman after God's heart, somebody that's willing to do all of his will. Amen. Amen.